All right, let's get this started. So thank you all for joining today. Uh, very excited to have our webinar getting started with service networking and secrets management on the cloud. Uh, we're gonna be talking about all things HCP today. So my name is Peter McCarran. I'm the Senior Product Marketing Manager uh, for Console. And uh, joining me today is Justin Weisig, who's our Technical Product Marketing Manager for Vault. Uh, we're gonna walk through each of these different things. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we are recording this webinar, so we will be posting it to our website uh, along with the slides, usually in about like one to two days. Uh, just after we finish post processing, uh, throughout the throughout the presentation, feel free to drop questions into the Q and A box. We'll be answering them throughout and at the end. Uh, and with that, we're going to go ahead and kick it off. So before I dive into the slideware, I'm going to show my screen here because we are doing this as a live demo, and I want to prove that we're doing this as a live demo. So I'm going to give a second here to share my screen. And as you can see, I'm going to be creating a console cluster right from the beginning. So I have everything set up, named my cluster, got my HVN, I have my console tier, and we're going to be talking all about what these things are in a moment, but I'm just kicking this off because there's a little bit of provisioning time, which will give me enough time to talk about HTTP console, and then we will go ahead and actually get some workloads running in it. So while that's creating, I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share, and we're going to switch back over to the slides just showing that we are in fact kicking that off right from the beginning. So let's talk about HTTP console. So HTTP console is a fully managed service mesh to discover and securely connect any solution. We're very, very excited about this product. Uh, we've been talking about it for a while. If you've been at our recent HashiComps, you've heard us talk about HTTP and kind of what it means for the company. And we, we feel really good about what, uh, what this is gonna do for our customers moving forward. Uh, you're going to hear about two different products today. So you're going to hear about HTTP console, and then you're also going to hear about HTTP Vault. And so before we dive into each of those individual products, I thought it'd be good if we talk a little bit about what HashiCorp Cloud Platform is and what's the problems that we're trying to solve for. So if you really look at reasons behind why we decided to create this, the things we hear as feedback from customers is that there is this challenge with the initial deployment of, of products sometimes. You know, when you're hosting your own solution, uh, what ends up happening is that depending on the configuration of your environment, depending on what you're trying to actually run, you can have some challenges and difficulties. Uh, the other piece is that not only is there challenges with getting started, but there's difficulty with ongoing underlying operations. So managing the infrastructure that I actually have to maintain in order to run these tools in my environments is, is a little bit tricky at times. And especially as the scale increases, we see that the complexity increases as well. Uh, and then the other part of it is, you know, we really pride ourselves on trying to have a consistent workflow from cloud to cloud. Uh, but that being said, you know, clouds are different. Uh, there's some complexity that if I'm deploying my deploying my tools, uh, that there's gonna be complexity if I'm moving it from AWS to Azure to GCP. Uh, so we wanna try and figure out, is there a way that we can build a platform that will provide a consistent deployment methodology in the future? So that, that's the general vision, is when you look at HashiCorp Cloud Platform as a whole, we're really just talking about, about a platform that hosts our tools. Uh, it's all gonna be about push button deployment. As you saw, I literally just hit create cluster and then I'm ready to go. There's a couple of small configurations that I had to do. This is fully managed infrastructure. The cluster that I'm deploying into is in the HashiCorp virtual network, uh, which is basically a private VPC that we host and we maintain and we have people monitoring for you. Uh, you no longer have to worry about handling the complexity of scaling up, scaling down. Uh, we're going to take care of that and our SR3 team is going to do an awesome job to give you guaranteed SLAs. And then as we add, right now everything's on AWS, but as we add additional clouds in here, it's going to be one multi-cloud workflow. So what we're going to have is essentially the same way to deploy into Azure, into AWS, into GCP, uh, it's all going to be one centralized platform, and Justin's going to walk you through more of the platform in, uh, here a little bit later. So let's talk about HTTP console. So for those of you who are familiar with console, uh, you know that it's a service discovery tool. It's also a service mesh. Uh, HTTP console is still going to deliver those same type of values, but in a slightly different way. Uh, one of the things that we really pride ourselves on is that service is that console has been a great service discovery tool. We have a lot of customers who are using it for that. And the idea is that when you're operating in a cloud environment, we want to make sure that there's a nice turnkey solution that you can start using it for service discovery. So HTTP console is going to allow you to be able to just as you deploy workloads to automatically detect those, keep them centralized, and provide you with real-time help checks. I'll show you a little bit of the UI so you can see kind of what that catalog looks like. But Ultimately, what we're trying to do is provide application teams with visibility into the services and understanding where they are. The second piece, which is a little bit different and interesting for our customers, is this idea of service mesh, service mesh as a service. 
what we're really trying to do is take the complexity out of getting into deploying a service mesh as well as maintaining it. Uh, one of the things we hear is that the larger the mesh grows, the more complicated it can become to run the actual mesh itself. And we really want our operators focusing more on the outcomes. So being able to enable those progressive delivery practices with their applications, being able to enable zero trust security. I'm gonna show you some of the TLS pieces, but as you know, when we have Vault and Console together, there's a really powerful security story there. And ultimately we're trying to make sure that you have global connectivity across multiple runtimes. So if you think about it from an AWS perspective, we're gonna provide support for EKS, the Kubernetes service, we're gonna provide support for VMs running in EC2. I'm gonna show you EKS today, but the if you are interested, we do have a number of learn guides for trying uh, vir virtual machine deployments as well. So the general benefits that organizations that we feel are going to are going to really benefit from HTTP console is this idea of this reduced operational burden. There's a reason that we put this at the top. Uh, essentially, what we feel is that you know organizations really want to have the help of HashiCorp professionals to be able to maintain these large deployments. They want to focus on their actual applications as opposed to making sure that the tool is running smoothly and consistently. Um, I think there are a lot of teams out there that when they are large enough, they are have become experts and they definitely know how to be able to operate our tools at a pretty large scale. Uh, but you know, sometimes there are some of those other folks that maybe don't have the whole SRE team that's necessary to be able to, to handle it. And they're just really looking to be able to take advantage of some of those services mesh capabilities. And that is where we're really trying to help people. The other piece is that because those operators can focus on the service mesh capabilities and their actual applications, they're going to experience this improved productivity. We're going to achieve a faster time to value for console because I'm not worried about getting it up and running. I'm just worried about getting the services connected. And the other piece I mentioned is that that's really nice about HTTP console is that it's secure by default. That means that TLS is automatically enabled. Uh, when I deploy the workloads a little bit later, you're going to see how those are actually restricted. And it's going to be, I think, a pretty compelling demo. Uh, but you're going to have this reduced risk. You have this peace of mind for your organization that as your operators are deploying new applications, that they are secure and that they are trusted. The process, the way, and you know, we threw a lot of information out here, but generally the way we kind of look at things about how you get started with HTTP console, it's really this four-step process. I've skipped ahead in a few steps. I just did the deploy <laughs> piece of it, and I've already peered. Uh, we're going to just focus on connect, but really the idea is that when you log into the platform, you're essentially going to create an HTTP account. You're going to deploy your virtual network, deploy a console co cluster. You're going to peer it with your existing AWS VPCs, and you're going to go ahead and connect it. So nice thing about getting started is if you're just kind of curious, like, you know, where do I go? Where do I get started? All these things. What you're going to do is you're going to, you're just going to get started with uh, creating, deploy, peer, and connect. And with that, let me see. I think I'm on to my next slide. Okay, cool. So here are some of the things that you can do to get started before I jump into the demo here. Uh, essentially, what you're looking at is you can deploy and configure an HTTP environment. Uh, so go ahead and log in, go to cloud.hashicorp.com, uh, and you can create it and you can actually deploy a cluster just with the click and go button like I did. Uh, you can actually deploy, you can actually connect up to EKS environments, which is what we're going to do today. It's going to allow us to be able, we're going to bootstrap HCLs, we're going to download our configurations, join EKS, and make sure everything's running. Uh, we're actually going to deploy an application. We're going to deploy some workloads so that you can see what's happening. You'll know that it's all encrypted by TLS. Uh, and again, one of the pieces we're going to do is we're going to deploy EC2. We're not going to deploy EC2 instances today. Uh, we do have learn guides on them. Uh, so if you are interested in how to deploy with virtual machines, I highly recommend checking out learn.hashicorp.com and checking out our cloud platform. Um, so there are guides for actually each one of these steps. I'm just going to walk through a handful of them. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and dive into it. So demo time. Give me a second here to share my screen. Okay, so what you can see here is that I have my cluster up and running. So as I said, I deployed this at the beginning. I have all my information here. I have, I can generate my admin tokens. I can generate my different client configurations. So one of the first things that we're gonna wanna make sure that we do, I'm gonna switch over to my terminal here, is I've already set up an EKS cluster that I have running. Uh, I'll show you all that in a second. But one of the things we wanna make sure we're doing is that everything is going to be pointing to the correct region. So I've already done this, but just in case, gonna make sure that our cube config understands which, which one we are actually talking to. I've created this cluster, it's just PCM test. And essentially what this is gonna do is it's just gonna make sure that everything has been 
has been updated. So I think we're good there. Cool. So now if I hop back into my screen here, I'm going to need to download this client configuration file. So this is what I'm going to actually use to make sure that my HTTP, is that my HTTP cluster can talk to my EKS cluster. Uh, there's just some permissions that I'm going to ultimately download and make sure that everything is right. So I download those here. We'll go back to our terminal. And I'm also going to generate a token because I'm going to need that in a second. And I will show you all how that works. So going to go ahead and go to my client configuration. Give me one second just to move some stuff around. Okay. This. Okay. And unzip this. All right, and so now we're in my repo. As you can see, I have here this client config bundle. This is the one that I just downloaded. Uh, we're going to go ahead and switch into this directory. And as you can see, I have, if you look in here, I have my configuration files and everything ready to go. So now before we get started, before I actually pair anything, what I'm going to need to do is, is set up some environmental variables. So I actually had overwritten my ACL token, so I'm going to get a new one. It's a nice thing is they are generated dynamically. I'm going to set these as a token layer. And I'm going to show you all the configuration file here in a second so you can understand where this is coming into play. But ultimately, what I just did is that I'm going to have a configuration file layer that uses that token. And it's going to, it's going to need to pull that uh, from the environmental. And then that way, I'm just not hard coding my tokens in there. And I can generate them dynamically. Uh, the next thing I, I need to do is I'm going to actually configure my, configure my environment and my secrets. So hopefully everybody can see this here, but I'm going to create an installation name. The file that I use is actually going to be um, pulling that information and we'll use it when we do our Helm deploy. Uh, this is following the same steps from our learn guide. So if you're curious kind of what I'm doing here, uh, go to learn.hashcorp.com and you can actually test this EKS pairing out as well. The next thing I'm gonna do is I need to create all my secrets. As I mentioned, it's all secure by default. So I need to create a number of secrets to be sure that everything is working because this is what it's going to pull from. So I create just my general cert, CA cert. I'm going to create my gossip key. And I'm going to create my bootstrap token. I copied and pasted these just because I didn't want to have to write them out. So now that I've done this, I'm basically ready to get started. So I've already added the Helm repo uh, to my environment here, but if you needed to, you just add the HashiCorp one. So you just go to you know, repo add and then add the helm.releases.hashicorp.com. Uh, the next piece is that there are some additional environmental variables that I need to do just so that I make sure that my EKS cluster is pointing at the, at the current HTTP cluster that I just configured. So there's a reach I join field that I need to have on there. There is the address that I want to make sure that it's pointing to the correct one. Okay. And because we're doing this, I don't recommend this. This is a non-production setup that I'm doing. I'm just showing as an example. Uh, we're disabling the SSL verify. Obviously, if I was doing this in a more secure environment, I'd want to make sure I do it. So that's all the environmental variables. But now let's actually show the kind of the meat of this with the, the config file that we have here. So as you can see, I have my I have my gossip key. So it's pulling the installation key that I, that I had on there. Uh, it's also going to pull my cert. It's going to use the auth method so that I've set the address so it knows where to go. It's going to show us where the hosts are. And uh, right now, this does have an ingress gateway. I'm actually going to remove that for now. Sorry, I thought I had to leave this out of here. You can do ingress gateways um, if you're looking for a way to securely communicate with in the mesh. Uh, I have my pod set up with a load balancer, so I'm not going to do that just yet. But uh, we will. Was it so? Going to move forward without that. But uh, if you are interested in the learn guide, it does have the ingress gateway information as well. Cool. So after setting all that up, I'm just going to run my Helm command to install everything.
And we're going to give that a second. So essentially what it's going to do, it's going to pull the chart. It's loading all the configs. As you can see, I have the installation name just so it's easy for me to remember. It's pulling that config.yaml that I just created. Uh, we're launching with version 28. Uh, you know, I just happen to be testing it with this one, but you can absolutely do future versions of the Helm chart uh, and that's going to all go. So I'll give it a second here. Computer's of course going to go a little bit slow while I'm getting all this set up. What it's doing right now is that it's not only loading uh, console into my EKS environment, but it's also bootstrapping my ACLs. So as I mentioned, HTTP console is has a default deny policy. So what it wants to do is it wants to make sure that everything is trusted and everything is secure before we actually have anything. Uh, if you aren't seeing my screen, you should be looking at the media player. There should be a, a terminal window. I don't know, Justin, if we can verify that folks are seeing that. Hey, Peter. Uh, on my end, it looks like um, it's a bit maybe frozen. Uh, right now, I see like a config file with oh, uh, yeah. some stuff yeah, highlighted. Uh, no, no, it's, it's loading. <laughs> Sorry, okay, this cool. is my computer, my computer going a little bit slow. I apologize. It's not it's not frozen. It's, it's my computer is going slowly. Uh, okay, cool. Of course, this is just because we are doing this live that my Helm chart is it is going to freeze, of course. So we're going to open up another one here and see how this is going. So it didn't it didn't freeze. I apologize. It's it's actually loading. If I open up my pods here. So it's initiating. I apologize, this is just running a little bit longer. <laughs> so as you can see, we are actually up and coming. So what I'm doing is I have now created, uh, is I've now created the, the test console uh, server that I have on there. It's running an ACL in it. Uh, it has my it web hooks for connect, injecting connect. I think I'm just because I'm running on 24 and my terminal at the same time that this is just taking a little bit longer than it normally would take. And it might time out on me. I'm not sure why this is all of a sudden taking so long. Let me go over to my screen here. So if you look on my EKS cluster. Hey, hey Peter, sorry. Um, yeah. We're still only seeing your uh, your terminal right now. I don't see your browser. OK, give me one second. I'm going to stop my screen share and see what's going on. Well, you're getting that up and running. Do you want me to jump over to the Vault uh, pieces? Yeah, go ahead and jump over to the Vault demo um, and Vault slides. Uh, I will work on this and, and see if I can get the demo up and running. I apologize for that. Yeah, no worries. Cool. I'm just going to skip ahead a few slides. Um, so um, I'll take a step back for a second and uh, talk about um, so HCP or HashiCloud or HashiCorp Cloud Platform is sort of an underlying layer that uh, we're building out. And then on top of that, we're building um, you know, our managed services. So as Peter was chatting about, you know, we're, we're having console there that's solving the use case of you know, uh, application to application communication, you know, how it's instrumented and uh, you know, how you can you know, authorize and authenticate uh, communication between various applications. So the second piece of the puzzle there is we're putting a hosted version of Vault on there. Right now, it's in uh, public beta. So, say for example, um, you know, you want to run Vault. Uh, it's a, you, there's sort of a spectrum of ways you can run it. It's obviously a, a very popular open source project that's free, so you can go and do it that way. Um, typically on prem or in the cloud, we have a um, an enterprise version of it. Say you're, um, you know, a large financial institution or something, and you know, you have a bunch of data centers. And um, you know you're looking to secure uh, secrets, you know API keys, tokens, you know TLS certificates, uh, all that type of stuff. Uh, you know you'll be running in one data center, but chances are you'll have multiple data centers, and you want to replicate that data. So we have uh, enterprise features that allow you to do high availability and disaster recovery. Um, so there's sort of two ways of running it. But we're also listening to a lot of feedback from customers that say, "Hey, you know what? We'd we're really interested in the cloud right now. Uh, and we're really loving managed services. And we'd really like it if HashiCorp would provide a managed service of Vault. Uh, so that gets us into uh, what I'm going to chat about right now. Let me just change to the next slide.
Um, so there's a question in here about uh, the high-level ar architecture of the HashiCloud uh, platform and how Vault is configured. I'll actually show you in a second, um, you know, what the console looks like, and we'll chat through the architecture there. So if you're 100% new to Vault, maybe I'll just chat about what it is at a high level, and then we'll uh, go into sort of the use cases. So um, Vault is a service that you run on your network. Uh, typically, it's open source. You know, a lot of folks are running it in open source, and then we have a, a bunch of enterprise users, and then you know we're running the managed version of it now. Uh, so the the benefits of it are obviously centralized secret management. Um, you know, we do a bunch of um, uh, application encryption sort of functionality in there. You could almost think of Vault as sort of a Swiss Army knife once you start using it. And then the real added benefit here is you know the fully managed infrastructure. You know, we look after the overall health of the cluster, snapshots, monitoring. We look after all the behind uh, the scenes operational tasks of, you know, scaling it. Um, so what I think I'll do is I'm just going to show you a, a live demo of it. And then, uh, um, you know, I'll answer any questions that uh, come in. At the end of this, obviously, we're going to have a large section of uh, Q&A time, too. So, you know, uh, if you have questions, just pop them into the chat. I have a window open here, and I'll, I'll see them, too. Also, while we're going through the demo, I think on the viewer portion of this, you have the capability to, um, you know, maximize the demo portion um, versus the slide. So that that'd probably be useful. All right, so let me switch over to uh, my demo screen here. Great. So you should be seeing um, my browser window right now, and. Um, I should also mention that, uh, you know, with uh, HCP Vault right now, uh, during the public beta, it's totally free. So everything I'm going to show you today, you can actually go to. So, you know, you can go to cloud.hashicorp.com, and you'll see our our website here for the managed services. This is where you're going to see, uh, you know, console and vault. Um, you know, right now we have two offerings. Well, actually three. You can, you can also run Terraform in the cloud. Um, so we have uh, console. You know, Vault, which I'm going to talk about now. And then if you're running Terraform, we have a managed version of that. So um, maybe I'll show you how to create an account. Um, so if you're on this website, cloud.hashicorp.com, you can go over to Vault. And then from here, you know, I already have an account, so I'm just going to sign in. But if you wanted to uh, replicate this. Oh, Peter, I think your mic, your mic might be uh, live there. Yeah, so if we go to uh, cloud.hashicorp.com, you can go to Vault. And then down here, you can just say, hey, I don't have an account. I want to create one. Now you can go through this process. It just takes a minute. Um, so I already have an account, so I'm just going to sign in. Then you link it with your GitHub ID. And I'll show you what the uh, admin panel looks like here. So someone earlier was asking, hey, what is the high-level architecture of um, uh, HCP or HashiCorp cloud platform look like. So you can think of it an underlying base layer of, um, you know, the infrastructure that sets up, you know, um, all the management infrastructure for, hey, I want to spin up, you know, hundreds of console clusters or, hey, I want to spin up hundreds of vault clusters, what that would look like. Um, you know, we want to do, uh, you know, rolling upgrades on the, on the vault side. We want to manage, you know, all the backups and restores, uh, you have the snapshots and stuff like that. Um, so there's a bunch of sort of behind-the-scenes automation that uh, facilitate us to manage these clusters for you. You know, we have dedicated um, global teams of SRE and support staff that are looking at all that stuff. Um, so once you log in, you'll see this is just the general, um, you know, admin panel. Again, you, you can just go create an account. Uh, I'd actually encourage you, if you want to test out Vault today, uh, to go create an account. You can spin up a demo cluster. It's free of charge. You know, right now during the beta period, we're just looking to gather feedback and sort of figure out, you know, the use cases that people are interested in, um, you know, running. Actually, maybe before I, I jump into the demo here, I'll, I'll just show you a couple of resources that will help you get started too. So we have a public uh, blog post. You know, if you just uh, Google, you know, announcing HTTP Vault public beta, you'll you'll come to this blog post. It has all the links in here. Um, there's a bunch of cool resources that talk about, um, you know, what it is, how it works. There's a, a great whiteboard video by Armon that sort of walks you through the end-to-end -end workflow of why we're doing this. You know, we're really focusing on, you know, we want you to be able to just push a button and get our services without having to, you know, 
dedicated uh, DevOps teams that are, you know, have pager duty and all this stuff behind the scenes to actually make sure it's up and running. Um, you know, I'll show you this in a second, but you know, that's what the admin console looks like. Fully managed infrastructure. There's also a sort of a gold mine of uh, learn content. Um, you know, if you're, if you've ever used HashiCorp uh, products, you can go to learn.hashicorp.com. And, you know, this is sort of like a, a gold mine of hands-on labs. So in here, you know, there's lots of getting started guides, um, you know, how to use HCP Vault. All of it's uh, free. You can just go, go and check it out. We have a dedicated section on here for HCP Vault, which walks you through, hey, how do I set this up? How do I peer it with my AWS uh, account and all that stuff? And, you know, how do I get my first secrets going? Also, if you have any uh, like feedback, you can go to our discuss forums. There's a HCP section in here. You can just post a post a you know a comment in there, and we'll get back to you. All right, so I think I'll go back to the the console here, and we'll we'll get started. So as Peter was sort of chatting about, you know, we can go and create a console cluster. You know, you can just click the deploy button. Um, you you can set a bunch of parameters in here, and then it'll go and kick off a deployment of your Vault cluster. Um, same thing with Vault. So right now I already have a vault cluster deployed, but I'll, I'll just show you what, um, uh, walk you through the process of creating a new vault cluster. So you'll give a cluster name in here. Um, you know, I could just use vault cluster. So the underlying platform that I chatted about before that's um, you know supporting these hosted managed offerings of console and vault um, right now is uh, running in AWS. So particularly for the Vault public beta, you know, we're running in US West 2. Uh, the goal for, you know, as we're progressing through the public beta and move towards, you know, general availability or GA is to expand our offerings of, you know, regions that we're available in. Also, we want to expand the clouds um, that we support, you know, so obviously Azure and GCP. So it doesn't matter if you know your company is running and say AWS and Azure. We want to make sure that we support both those and in the regions that you actually want to run this. Um, and then we provide this added feature, particularly for testing, you know, of um, allowing the Vault cluster to sit on the public internet. You know, typically we don't suggest that hey, um, you know, you'd run a production Vault cluster and attach it to the just general public internet. Um, but we realize, you know, during testing that you might be, you know, working on your laptop and want to connect into your vault cluster. And we want to make that as, uh, you know, smooth as possible. So you can flip this little flag and it gives you a public IP address on your vault cluster. Um, so in here, I have a, a vault cluster that's already created. Also, I should mention that, um, you know, when you go through this create cluster, you'll create this. And it takes about, um, right now it takes about 10 minutes to spin up the vault cluster. So what's happening behind the scenes is we're not actually doing a multi-tenant infrastructure or anything like that. So when you go and create this cluster, we're, um, right now we have a three node cluster that's being spun up behind the scenes. So we're actually provisioning the virtual machines, you know, we're um, you know, bootstrapping the cluster. And once the cluster uh, is online, that's what you're seeing. So during the beta, that's the current setup. You know, we're looking to expand that offering of, you know, different sizes as we move to GA. So I'll go into the cluster here. Um, you'll notice that, hey, we have a few getting started guides. You know, the cluster is in a running state. It's uh, version 1.6. We have the public and private uh, URLs, so you can go in there. There's also some sort of uh, back-end infrastructure stuff that you can look at. You know, we're doing automated snapshots of, your, of the data. Um, so say, for example, you uh, end up blowing something up here, you know, you could go and restore it. Same thing with the cluster. You know, I've already created, uh, a, um, you know, a peering relationship with AWS um, here into uh, a VPC. Some, someone in the comments was also mentioning about, hey, are you going to support Transit Gateway? We're actively working on that uh, behind the scenes. So um, you might hear something about that shortly. Um, so I have the cluster up and running. Uh, now what? Right. So I'm going to generate a token. Um, I'm going to copy this. And then uh, what I've done is I've copied this uh, public address. And I'll just go over here. You know, you can see, hey, I have a vault cluster. It's running in uh, uh, AWS. You know, here's the URL that you'll get. Obviously, for the private version, you know, you'll, you'll get an a AWS internal URL. 
I'll paste my token in here. Uh, you know, I have my uh, various secret engines enabled. Um, you know, I have a hello webinar uh, secret in here that's uh, the password set to password, right? So I know this seems very simple and that's sort of the whole point. We want you to be able to just click a button, get a, a vault cluster up and running, and then you don't have to manage any of the backend infrastructure. You know, you can just go and use your secret engines. You can zip through the learn guides um, and basically get up and running with the vault cluster uh, really quickly. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll stop there. I'll also, uh, maybe I'll go back to the uh, uh, questions and Q&A section there and just see if there's uh, anything. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Actually, Peter, maybe I'll check in and see how things are going on your side. Still having some technical difficulties. I may have to record this and, and send it uh, out with this. So yeah, yeah, no worries. Apologize. Okay, cool. Um, if you have any uh, questions, uh, just throw them into the uh, Q and A section there, and uh, and uh, Peter and I will go through them. Yeah, um, I think a good question here is that like. So one of the things that Sharon asked about like where the secrets are being stored, uh, I think ideally you'd want to use something like Vault to store those. Like I'm just doing them as environmental variables and like kind of storing them in Kubernetes secrets. <laughs> um, that's, you know, again, I'm just doing it as a development. It's not necessarily like the right way to go about it. So I apologize again for all the frozen screen shares. I don't know what happened. I literally ran this this morning. But anyway, <laughs> um, no here's a question. Peter. Yeah, here's a question, Justin. Uh, so, do you have an example? Like, can you maybe talk a little bit about like how applications like could use like secrets from Vault? Um, so maybe talk a little bit about dynamic secret generation or, or anything like that. Sure. Um, well, let's just start with a, a super simple example. So, say for example, you um, you know in a three tier web application type thing. Um, you know, typically I'm going to have a web server. I'm going to have an application sitting on it, and then I'm going to have some sort of back end data store. Um, you know, say for example, you're running like a, an online store. Um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna have a bunch of products in there. Uh, you're gonna have some user data that's they're gonna generate. Uh, you know, maybe they're gonna log in with a username and password so they can buy that stuff. You're gonna have you're gonna be processing credit cards. Uh, you know, and maybe you're sending emails. It's a super typical thing that uh, you know people all across the internet are doing every day, right? But even in this very simple example, you're handling very secret data. You know, you're gonna have customer uh, usernames and passwords. You're gonna be handling credit cards. You're typically gonna wanna encrypt that traffic. You're gonna be sending emails. Um, so by just definition of that simple use case, you're gonna be handling lots of secret data. So how are you protecting it? Traditionally, a lot of folks are just hard coding, um, you know, say a, a database connection string right into their uh, application. Um, or maybe, hey, I'm processing uh, credit cards. How am I protecting that uh, information? You know, maybe I'm accessing an external um, API, maybe like Stripe for uh, uh, credit card processing. How am I protecting those API keys? What about when I'm, um, you know, sending those emails? Maybe I'm uh, uh, using an external provider like Mailchimp. So, say for example, there's all of a sudden a vulnerability in your application. Uh, you know, attacker gets onto the box that's actually running your application and they start uh, browsing through your source code and realize, hey, there's a database connection string in here. Um, let me go and try that. And, you know, they go over to the database and they're able to dump the raw contents of your database. You now have a, a massive exposure of, um, you know, credit card, uh, potentially credit card data if they're able to use that API key to go over to your, uh, you know, credit card provider. They could potentially pull down your entire email list. They have all of your, um, you know, customer data now. So uh, this is a very typical thing that happens all the time. Uh, so the the core use case of Vault here is, hey, I want to I, I want to start protecting that data. So with Vault, you can store those, you know, database credentials in Vault. Hey, I can store those API keys in Vault. And I can also use Vault's, um, you know, tokenization or transit functionality to actually encrypt customer data. So, you know, you can do all this just with the free version, open source version of Vault. And, you know, tons of uh, companies are actually doing that. Uh, so now when, um, you know, in that architecture, we talked about, a, um, you know, a application and a database, 
you know, now when the application says, hey, I want to connect to the database, um, instead of hard coding that connection string, it actually calls out to Vault and says, hey, uh, give me that, um, uh, the credentials I need to connect to this database. It might also do that on, you know, via dynamic uh, credentials or something like that, but that's a bit more advanced. But just the general thing to probably take away from this is, hey, I want to uh, request a credential. I'm going to ask Vault. What Vault's doing behind the scenes is, you know, it's auditing and logging all that functionality. So now you have uh, actually logs of, hey, when did this uh, particular application uh, call this credential? Um, uh, also, if, uh, you know, hey, I want to process a credit card, you know, your application can call Vault and say, hey, I need a particular API key to go and uh, process this um, credit card. What's kind of cool about this is, you know, you can set up access policies of, um, you know, you can potentially identify or even deny uh, access if, you know, someone's trying to uh, pull one of these credentials using a, a different account or a different IP address or something like that. So that's sort of like the high level use case of, hey, why would I even use Vault? Um, you know, how do I protect customer data with it and things like that? Um, obviously, when you're running Vault, uh, you know, open source or uh, enterprise version, you know, it's typically in the critical path of your application. So if it goes down, all of a sudden, that's a, you know, a fairly large problem. And so, you know, you could imagine if you're a, a bank or a large, uh, you know, insurance company or something like that, they want to have enterprise features that provide high availability, you know, disaster recovery and, you know, guarantee uptime. That's typically where, our, you know, our enterprise features come in. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Uh, that's why yeah. that's why we want to run the on on prem or the managed service uh, version of Vault. Um, you know, we want to basically uh, run Vault. Uh, you know, using our best practices. You know, with the folks who actually built it uh, behind the scenes supporting it, and basically give you know our customers sort of the peace of mind that you know um, if if there's some sort of uh, downtime event or something, uh, you know, we're there to help. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, we had a couple other questions come in. Uh, so I'll answer a couple of them real quick. And then, then there's a bunch of all questions for you in here, Justin. <laughs> uh, so what is it? Where, where is it? Um, so uh, as far as like support, so right now, uh, we are only supporting uh, it on AWS. Uh, we will add additional clouds in the future. We don't have a specific timeline for it just yet. Uh, we do, uh, and we don't have any uh, cost price or any pricing available for, for Vault beyond Bandit just yet. So stay tuned. Um, funny enough, my demo looks like it started working. So I'm going to give you one more question, Justin, and then I'm going to see if it actually is you know, just tricking me. Uh, and I can yeah, jump sure. back into it. <laughs> but uh, so can you, uh, let's see. Can uh, let's pull. They got a whole bunch of them in here for you. So, can you talk a little bit about the difference between like using? I know you talked a lot about like how you use Vault, uh, but uh, can you give kind of the top five differences between like the open source and the enterprise version? Uh, I think that you know we offer obviously the hosted and uh, now we have the managed version and then we have enterprise and open source. So maybe just run down that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So there's obviously a spectrum of um, you know how folks want to run uh, Vault and basically want to support you know all of them. So there's often uh, primarily there's the big open source project, right? Where um, you know there's a bunch of internal developers as well as a, a, a large portion of external. Uh, community members that are, you know, improving Vault every day. Uh, you know, if you go in there, it's just amazing the velocity uh, of the project. You know, there's, I, I mentioned sort of earlier, it's sort of like a Swiss Army knife. You know, there's a, a huge capability and, you know, various secret engines and sort of plugins and configurations that we support. So, you know, um, if you're running on any cloud provider, chances are we have lots of in different integrations with that, right? Uh, so that's sort of the open source piece. You know, it's totally free, you know, production ready, People are running it at massive scales right now. Um, but uh, the sort of problem happens when, uh, you know, enterprise companies come to us and they say, hey, uh, you know, we really like Vault, uh, but, you know, we need support. Uh, also, you know, we're running uh, 16 data centers globally and we need, um, you know, cross data center replication. We also need performance replicas because, you know, we're doing, you know, 10,000 requests a second. And this application is actually in the critical path of, you know, our, our, you know, company. So, 
uh, we'd really like to enter into a relationship with you where we can basically pay you money and you'll support us and you know offer these enterprise features. So that's where the enterprise version comes into play. And then obviously the managed service is, um, hey, maybe I'm a small uh, startup all the way to like mega enterprise. Uh, I'm interested in running Vault, but you know I don't want to manage the sort of operational overhead of you know having this uh, having Vault in the critical path of my applications. Um, so that's where you know you can pay us a, a monthly fee and we'll look after a Vault for you. Obviously, in the public beta, you can just go use it for free and you know kick the tires on it and see what you think. So, um, I guess to answer the question more succinctly, you know, there's a spectrum of different use cases and we want to su support them. And so, the addition of the uh, managed service is, uh, you know, expanding that capability. Thanks, Justin. All right, give me one second here just to log in. And and I'm going to bring back on my screen here. I'm just jumping ahead in some of the steps on the demo, so that way we can save time. <laughs> Make sure we see where we're at. Cool. All right. So let's share my screen here again. Okay. Let me know, Justin, if we're seeing my terminal window. Hopefully it doesn't freeze up on us again. Sure. I don't see anything uh, just yet. Nope, just started it. So it should start in just a second here. Okay. Yeah, I see your be. terminal. All right, cool. So <laughs> this is the problem with copying and pasting commands. I messed up one of my environmental variables. So <laughs> normally what you'd see is that you get an install uh, window here where it's say thank you for installing it. You can get the status. If you look over here, I just ran it. So where I got my pods, as you can see, I have my t console test server. I have my connect injector for um, being able to use for being able to use connect, uh, and I've deployed an application. It's just a basic two tier application where I have a front end and a back end. If I jump back over into my other windows here, so here's my EKS cluster. As you can see, I have everything running in here. It has my nodes and everything. If I refresh it, it's going to show all the different services that I have running. Okay, and get this updated. All right. Well, gas is being a pain. But anyways, if I go into my screen here, what you see is I have my console server that I mentioned. I have my front end and my back end, and it's actually connected in the service mesh with the proxy. It's failing right now because of the you know poor Kubernetes code on my part. But basically what's happening is that right now you'll notice there's some health checks that are failing. And also, as I mentioned before, everything is secure out of the box. So even though I have these routes kind of already installed on my application, what's happening is that HTTP console is going to have a default deny policy in place. So it's not gonna allow actually any of these to be able to communicate with each other unless I tell them to. So what I have to do is I have to create the intentions. You could do this via the CLI, but I'm just gonna do it for easy use through here. So I'm gonna choose that my front end can talk to my back end. I do an allow. I'm going to add another one now where my back end in turn can talk to the front end. So I've now created this policy. If we go back into my services, see everything in the mesh here. Now you see there's no longer these arrows that are that are causing problems anymore. So what I can do is if I flip back to my terminal screen here, and I get my services, you're going to see that it, because I set this up as a load balancer, I have an external IP for this. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to go in here. Hopefully this flutters back on. I've been having some help check issues, so I apologize not. And I have basically my very fancy HashiCorp image generation, generation. So now if I do this, I hit get an image and I actually am able to get my images now. So if I go back in and if I remove those intentions that I just created, and I say that, nope, nothing can talk to this. So you see, I've canceled this now where the back end can't talk to the front end. If I try to get my random image again, I no longer can get a random image. 
So that was just a quick high level, but basically what I wanted to show is that when you deploy an application, it has just default deny in place. Um, this is gonna be really, really helpful uh, where you can have, you know, just making sure that if services are getting added into your HTTP environment, uh, that, you'll, that you won't have to worry about it being able to talk to everything. So it's just from a security standpoint, really a, a, a great posture. And so we can get back to the questions now. <laughs> I just wanted to show that everything was, was up and running. So let's see. Uh, we had a couple more questions. Um, I don't know if you touched on this, uh, Justin, but I think this was about like just the migration steps. From a high level standpoint, do we have any guidance about like, how people would shift from maybe like Vault open source to migrating to to HCP Vault in the future? Um, that's a good question. We're working on it right now, but typically it would be like, um, uh, you know, we want to support, you, you know, that use case of, hey, I want to like dump my data and then I want to bring it into HTTP Vault. Right now, we, we don't have a way of doing that, but, uh, you know, it's something we're actively working on and hopefully we'll have something more soon. Sorry, I don't have uh, like a specific <laughs> answer for it, but like, you know, it is obviously a top priority for us to, to look at that. Absolutely. I'm going to, and I had a question come in asking about just the, the different documentation and steps. I'm going to drop in the tutorial that I followed along with here. So give me one second. Maybe while so, you're doing that, I'll answer a few questions here. So yeah, uh, absolutely. It looks like we have a lot of kinds of questions. <laughs> um, so, right, I have a lot of questions. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so there's uh, a question about, hey, um, you know, are audit logs able to be exported out of HCP for Vault? Uh, yeah, you can just go to the console and export the logs there. You know, obviously we want to support use cases of, hey, you know, I'm running, um, you know, uh, Elasticsearch or, hey, I'm running uh, Splunk. How do I export the logs? We want to support real-time use cases like that too. Right now in the beta, we're just sort of proving out the, the concept. You know, we're gathering lots of feedback. And so when we go to GA, you're going to see a lot of these sort of you know, more enterprise features uh, appear. Um, again, like I'd 100% encourage you if you're at all interested in playing around with Fault, you know, now's a great opportunity to just go over to the, the website and you can fire up a free cluster and play around with it, go through the learn guides. Uh, you know, it, it's a great opportunity. Yeah. Um, there's we a question another... here. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, we had a question come in about asking about, can I run this on a private cloud, not connected to the internet? Uh, the answer is no right now, uh, because we are managing that infrastructure. So we do need to be like, it, it's actually running within our own environment, as opposed to running within within your environment. I'd recommend probably looking at either our um, enterprise or open source solutions for running in a private cloud. So Justin, go ahead. <laughs> the next yeah, question. I'll just, I'll just tack on to that. Like, uh, uh, I guess the the use case is, hey, I'm running in a private cloud, you know, hosted on-prem. Uh, we 100% support that use case. You know, Vault is run even on air-gapped, uh, you know, even in air-gapped, say, government environments or something like that, where, hey, you know, I need a centralized uh, secret store. But typically, they're using the enterprise version that, you know, they'd manage themselves. Uh, you know, if you're looking for something managed, then, you know, that would be in our environment. Yeah. Uh, Justin, you had a... Uh question come in about SSH keys in Vault? Um, sure. Uh, it's probably a long-winded answer to get into that, but I'd probably just, you know, go into Google and type HashiCorp Vault SSH, and you'll come up with a solution page that has, you know, all the docs, uh, you know, YouTube videos, learn guides, basically that everything uh, you're interested in that use case. Uh, there's also another thing in here. Hey, uh, in the example you gave of the three-tier application, you know, since you're ad adding additional API calls out to Vault, does that increase the latency? Um, yeah, obviously it, it does because you know you're making an external call. But typically, you're going to have Vault sitting right beside your, you know, your applications, and it's going to be you know milliseconds. Uh, I think the the pros definitely outweigh the cons. You know, if an attacker gets in and you have things hard coded or you know you have passwords sitting in a, a text file. Uh, it's going to be, they're just going to, you know, log in and dump your database and steal all your credentials so, or steal all your data. So would you rather have, you know, a few milliseconds of latency or, you know, sort of like a much larger uh, impact of a breach? So, um, yeah, you do pay a, a little bit, but um, uh, I think the, the pros definitely outweigh the cons. I'll also say that, you know, you're probably interacting with applications that are, uh, powered by Vault behind the scenes, you know, on a daily basis. You know, there's uh, a lot of enterprise customers out there that are, are using Vault, uh, you know, and, and they've architected it into their infrastructure. Yeah. 
We had a question come in about uh, connecting your on-premise cluster with HCP. Uh, in the future, yes, that is definitely a use case that we are looking at. Uh, however, uh, as it stands right now, we're only supporting AWS environments for HCP console, and then Vault obviously is in, in beta. Okay. There's a Let's... question in here about, hey, um, you know, I'm interested in running Vault on, um, uh, you know, GCP here. Uh, I guess it depends on where in GCP you want to run it. So, um, you know, if you're looking at just running it on traditional VP or uh, VMs, um, uh, like GCE, you can go, you know, uh, just follow our, our general best practice of, you know, how to install Vault. If you're looking at installing Vault on, um, you know, uh, GKE, uh, you know, the Kubernetes engine there, uh, just go the, by far the easiest way is to use our Helm chart. So if you just uh, Google Vault, you know, Helm chart, you'll come up with a, a blog post with a video that I did uh, and also like a tutorial that you can follow. That's by far the, the easiest way of uh, getting started with uh, Vault on, on Google. Yeah. Um, just to add on to one of the questions I've seen come in a couple of times about Vault on GCP, uh, if you go to hutchcorp.com slash resources, we have a number of different use cases and different examples of how we've used Vault on, on GCP as well. Um, so, I mean, if we, we, we can have a couple of different use cases, but primarily right now, HTTP Vault and console are running on AWS. <laughs> uh, let's see. As far as the question just came in about Fargate, um, so we support Fargate on EC2 instances right now at GA. We are working on building out a more robust, so if you're going to be running Fargate with EKS, uh, that, is, that is coming in the future. Uh, but right now, it's only on, on EC2 instances that we are running that. Uh, let's see. I'll take one here. So there's a, yeah. a few questions in here about, hey, how does this, how does Vault compare to like uh, Azure, uh, you know, Key Vault or AWS Secret Manager? Um, you know, once you have Vault, uh, you know, the service sort of sitting on your network there, whether it's, you know, on-prem or it's the managed offering, you can think of Vault as sort of like a Swiss army knife that has a, a, a ton of different capabilities. You know, we provide, um, uh, you know, not only just static secrets, hey, I want to, you know, store this username and password or API key. We also support um, the concept of dynamic secrets. Hey, I want a secret that's only available for, you know, five minutes while I run this uh, backup job or something like that. So we have a lot of advanced capabilities around, um, you know, dynamic secrets. We also have uh, a whole ecosystem of different plugins. So, you know, say, hey, I'm running in Azure, I'm running in GCP, and I'm running in AWS. We actually have plugins that you can run that'll you know, go and create and fetch dynamic keys. So we can provision credentials on the fly um, so that uh, folks don't necessarily have highly privileged API keys. There's also the capability of um, you know, rotating uh, database credentials. Say, hey, I have a, a database. I'm required by f some sort of regulation to rotate this password every 30 days. You know, we have the capability of, you know, using these plugins to go and, uh, you know, rotate those credentials. You know, same thing with, um, you know, host username and passwords or something like that. So there's a whole uh, capability uh, associated with Vault, as well as, you know, tokenization and data encryption. So um, it, it's hard to sort of say, hey, you know, we compare with these various features. Um, it's sort of, you have to look at Vault and say, hey, I have these use cases and then uh, go and map that to it. So I just say that, you know, Vault is very uh, feature complete and there's a lot of use cases that we support. Uh, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I think you might have touched on this, but I just want to make sure we covered it. Um, so it's a very simple question. Uh, as far as like, so Vault, HTTP Vault is running on AWS, but you could use it to store secrets for anything, correct? Yeah, hundred percent. You can just think of it like, a, um, you know, obviously we support, uh, you know, API keys, um, you know, usernames and passwords and stuff like that. But you could almost think of it like a key value store. Hey, I, I have this data in there. I, I want to store it. Um, and then I want to retrieve it later. We support all different types of, uh, you know, input formats and things like that. You know, uh, chances are, if you have any secret data, you can store it in Vault. Yeah. Um, say so yes asking about the vault console support for applications running in ecs from an HTTP standpoint um you know i don't know if we're going to be able to support that just yet that is something that we are looking at uh i don't know just if you want to talk to the vault support for for fargate at all 
Uh, it's probably a, a you know a longer thing that we can cover just yeah. in the webinar. I just say you know just go Google. It. You'll that's the awesome thing about Vault is that you know it's super popular, and if you have a question about it, you can just go Google it and, and you'll find the answer. <laughs> yeah, I definitely recommend checking out the documentation. Uh, real quick, just uh, high level, they come in. Can you talk a little bit about tokenization? Uh, what what it is? Yeah, sure. So before I mentioned, hey, I have this three tier application. Um, you know, it's sort of like a web store, uh, you know, I'm accepting uh, credit card transactions and, you know, that's a very simple use case, but you could imagine, you know, uh, the complexity and the amount of PII or, you know, personally identifiable information that you, uh, accumulate, especially if you're a large store, you could think of like a big box retailer or something like that. You're going to have, um, uh, you know, membership numbers, they might even do some sort of loans. So they're going to have, you know, highly, you know, privileged, you know, account numbers and, you know, maybe social insurance numbers or that type of data. Uh, say, you know, you are using Vault and, you know, a sophisticated attacker is able to get into your database and they dump it. Uh, you know, everything is there in plain text. So we have this capability in Vault called tokenization, which will allow you to actually encrypt that data that's sitting in the database. So, and that's, uh, we do that through tokenization. So you can think of like a credit card number or a passport number or a driver's license number or something like that. Hey, I, I have this secret piece of data. Um, I want to protect it, but uh, you know, I'm going to replace it with a token that represents that data. And then, you know, uh, Vault has that mapping or we use something called FPE that, um, you know, actually encrypts the uh, value and you can go back and unencrypt it. So, you know, even if someone goes in and they're able to access your database and they go and dump it, uh, you know, you, they might have, uh, you know, less privileged PII data in there, but all the highly privileged stuff like, you know, account numbers, uh, credit card numbers, passport numbers, all that stuff's going to be encrypted. So even, even when they do have the database, it's still not that useful to them. So that's the sort of core capability of tokenization. Super cool feature. Um, you know, it, it, we're, you know, super excited to like support that. Yeah, absolutely. And so we had a couple questions about like multi uh, cloud. So that is something in the future. So stay tuned. Uh, we are very excited about that. Uh, we'll see if we have any last minute questions come in here. Actually, I, sh I should also mention that, you know, uh, tokenization is an enterprise feature. So um, that we do have a, a demo license where you can go and, you know, download Vault, uh, you know, the enterprise version, plug in this uh, uh, demo license and play around with uh, tokenization. But that's typically sort of, um, you know, an enterprise type feature. Uh, and that's why we are, uh, you know, have it on the enterprise side. All right. Well, it looks like we're right at time here, Justin. And I think we got through most of the questions. Uh, is there anything else outstanding? Uh, uh, nothing well, on my side. Yeah. I just want to say, uh, you know, obviously, thanks, Peter, for doing the uh, console piece. And, you know, thanks for uh, showing the demo there. I also want to thank everyone on, um, you know, for joining the webinar. I'd also just reiterate, you know, if you uh, at all want to play around with Vault, um, you know, it's free right now. Uh, just definitely go over and create an account and play around with it. So thanks yeah, very same. much. Yeah, and same on the HTTP console side. Uh, we are offering twenty dollars credits if you sign up and you know you want to try it out. The development SKU is available for you. Uh, so thank you all for joining the webinar. Uh, just to recap, this was recorded. Uh, we will be po uh, posting it to our website after some uh, post processing. Uh, and if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out. And other than that, have a great day. Thank you all. See ya.